a $1.9 million lawsuit regarding the Idaho 4 case. That's the latest with a TikToker in trouble, but will a YouTuber be next? Let's also discuss Ashley Banfield's new News Nation report about Bethany, one of the surviving roommates in the Idaho 4 tragedy, and why I think she never went upstairs or never saw the victims or why she's in hiding now. So imagine being a cisgender woman like me, born a female with all the baby photos to prove it. Then you go off to college and you live in a home and all of a sudden there's a terrible tragedy. Four of your friends that you you love or slaughtered. You're one of the two survivors. And not only did you survive, the alleged perpetrator walks right past you with his bushy eyebrows and probably carrying a K-bar knife somewhere on him and hiding part of his face with a mask. Then imagine after surviving all that tragedy and trying to get through the loss of your friends and survivor's guilt and Lord knows what else Dylan is feeling, you jump onto YouTube one day a few months later, February of 2023, all of a sudden this grown man is lobbing all these accusations against you. He's claiming you're not a cisgender woman. He's claiming you're transgender, that you were the actual target in the 1122 King Road murders, that you've been beat up, and you're spilling all the beans to this guy for some reason. Even worse, this man turns his ire on another one of the Idaho 4 victim's friends. He starts claiming on February 21st, 2023 that this girl named Ashlyn was the one who literally ordered the hit that you were the real target of. This is the mayhem going on right now in YouTube land and social media world in the absence of a lot of other real facts coming out. As we wait for Brian's preliminary hearing, if it happens, people seemingly are turning on their fan fiction skills as if they're watching some fictional story instead of a real life tragedy with real victims. Today is Tuesday, February 21st, and with what I've uncovered, I'd say more people have reasons to file lawsuits in this Idaho 4 case. Just look at the latest paperwork I've found regarding a $1.9 million lawsuit filed against a TikToker. I think this new YouTuber on the scene who's lobbing all these slanderous and libelous accusations against Dylan the survivor and even a friend of the victim needs to take note about what's happening with this TikTok lawsuit. You might remember the trouble that TikToker Ashley Gilliard got into when she accused a University of Idaho professor of somehow being involved in the murders. Ashley goes under a bunch of different names, but Ashley Solves Mysteries is one of them. Ashley did not respond, at least in terms of legal motions filed, to Professor Rebecca Schofield's lawsuit. It was a defamation lawsuit. It was her last ditch effort to get Ashley to stop making these TikToks accusing Rebecca of all sorts of heinous things. Schofield explained that she served the TikToker with legal paperwork and Ashley just kind of blew it off. Now, in a new filing, thank God I checked and found it, it was just filed four days ago February 17th, 2023. Professor Schofield is asking the court to award her a default judgment of approximately $1.9 million. To be exact, she wants a default judgment in her favor, at least $1 million $863,304. Schofield's attorney, Wendy Olson, said, the statements made about Professor Schofield are false, plain and simple. What's even worse is that these untrue statements create safety issues for the professor and her family. Let's take a look at the most interesting parts of what Rebecca Schofield has been through, what she told the court, before we look at what this YouTuber is accusing others of and how he might want to take heed to what Ashley the TikToker is going through. So there's an 11 page filing filed February 17th, 2023. Rebecca Schofield is the plaintiff versus Ashley Gilliard, the defendant. It gives you a little backstory about what happened. After the four University of Idaho students lost their lives, that's when Ashley took to her TikTok to make all these accusations against Professor Schofield. So the lawsuit says that Ashley just randomly targeted Professor Schofield and stated repeatedly to a broad audience that Professor Schofield had an inappropriate 
inappropriate romantic affair with one of the victims and then ordered the murder of all four students. It sounds kind of similar to what the YouTuber is doing by blaming this innocent girl, Ashlyn, of ordering the hit on the four students. So instead of engaging in some kind of online feud, she didn't want to bring any further attention to Ashley's claims. And that's why I'm not naming the YouTuber because I don't want to bring any further light to his channel. Even though if you look around, people are already figuring out who he really is. So it might be pretty easy for his victims to figure out who he really is too and serve him with a similar lawsuit. So Professor Schofield didn't put Ashley on blast. She took the responsible approach. She sent two private cease and desist letters before asking the court to intervene. In response, Ashley continued her self-promotion, says the lawsuit, just totally disrespecting the entire legal process. She posted videos acknowledging this lawsuit, advancing conspiracy theories about corruption and the Moscow Police Department. Ashley was saying that's what led to the arrest of Brian Kohlberger, according to this lawsuit. The lawsuit states that Ashley even claimed Brian Kohlberger and Professor Schofield worked in cahoots together to commit this crime. And Ashley ignored court deadlines and failed to file timely responsive pleadings. No regard for the truth, Ashley continued posting sensational TikTok videos about the murders. Ashley's fame rose with each video as her videos were widely reposted and viewed millions of times. It says that Ashley even posted a video suggesting she would use one of the cease and desist letters as toilet paper and that Professor Schofield would need to file actual legal documents in a federal court. It's sad if you're going to go spouting off in your videos, you should know more about the law. By admitting you got the cease and desist letters, you're already proving that you ignored them. I just checked Ashley's TikTok. She has several ones, but she's still spouting off theories about Rebecca Schofield filing in Idaho while Ashley lives in Texas as if that would negate everything. Left with no other options to stop the post, Professor Schofield filed her complaint. And that same day, Ashley posted a TikTok acknowledging service and the Moscow Police Department issued a press release stating that it didn't believe Professor Schofield was involved at all with the crime. Three days later, that's when law enforcement arrested Brian Koberger. And despite this new evidence, it's like, you know, Ashley didn't take a mea culpa at that point and say, oh, my bad, I was wrong. She continued to dig in her heels. Instead, the lawsuit says that Ashley continued to prolifically post videos making false statements about Professor Schofield. Ashley posted videos claiming that she's going to win her case and accuse Professor Schofield's lawyers of witness tampering. Ugh, the shade. Despite having plenty of time to post defamatory content online, Ashley failed to timely file responsive pleadings. Ashley's got all this time to post TikTok videos instead of figuring out how to post a responsive filing and file it. Maybe it would not have come to this point if she had taken her medicine and said, my bad, and filed things. If she would have stopped with the cease and desist and deleted all those videos, I bet you Schofield would have left it alone. Rebecca is going to talk about all the suffering she went through as a result of these TikTok videos. It has in the notes, Ashley's videos are too prolific to list exhaustively, but some examples are available at, and they have ashisgod.com links and TikTok links, Ash is God in the flesh, Ash is in the book of life, all these videos. You know, they really get into details here about Ashley claiming Professor Schofield used her position of power to to engage in a wrong relationship with one of the victims, a student. All these defamatory statements. Finally, Professor Schofield has been damaged by Ashley's false statements. She suffered emotional distress, suffered harm to her personal and professional reputation, and incurred expenses to protect her and her family from individuals who may believe Ashley and seek vengeance, which is one of the main, one of the main problems here. It says that starting the day after after the complaint was filed, Ashley spent her time posting at least 100 videos on TikTok, writing three blog posts, talking to reporters, 
recording a 40 minute YouTube video and interacting with viewers in the comment section. If she, <laughs> it's really pretty shady. It's a, it's a good motion here. If she had spent that time putting those defenses into an answer instead of boasting online to get more clicks, she could have filed a timely response. But she chose self-promotion over respect for the judicial process. That was her decision to make. Ashley intentionally chose not to file a timely answer. She should have to live with the consequences. Whoa. They're calling Ashley's conduct beyond egregious, and she made a spectacle of the tragic loss of four young lives. And this is the part where I was like, whoa, the court should award Professor Schofield at least, <laughs> at least $1,863,304. Now, before you think that's a crazy high amount, they're going to reference when Cardi B sued YouTuber Tasha K as a previous case. But first, they're going to talk about Professor Schofield's emotional distress, personal and professional reputational harm, and expenses once again incurred to protect her and her family. They talk about Professor Schofield's salary and how that was jeopardized. Professor Schofield is employed at the University of Idaho where she earns $75,064.28 annual salary along with an administrative increment of $11,266.12 for serving as chair of the history department. The TikTok videos jeopardized Professor Schofield's advancement at the University of Idaho, including salary increases, promotion to full professorship, and selection for leadership positions, jeopardized the publication of book manuscripts, articles, book chapters that are pending review, her ability to collaborate with co-authors, her ability to perform new studies and produce new work that require speaking to or working with LGBTQ plus populations and it's caused severe mental distress. Listen to this is ridiculous. Professor Schofield receives hate mail, which is ridiculous. It shows you that while average, normal, logical people like us can jump onto TikTok, we can listen to what Ashley's saying and then we're able to logically deduce, yeah, that doesn't sound right. I doubt Professor Rebecca Schofield had anything to do with the Idaho crimes, but she's getting hate mail. That proves some people can log on and look at the most outrageous theories and say, oh my goodness, that's true. I hate this professor. I'm going to write her a strongly worded hateful letter. So she receives hate mail. She cries often. She cannot sleep and she must take sleep aids. She fears for her and her family's safety as members of anti-education groups oppose her work on gender studies and LGBTQ plus issues at a public institution. Ashley's homophobic rhetoric and highlighting of Professor Schofield's research amplifies that opposition. And Professor Schofield worries that Ashley's false attempts may prompt somebody to take violent action either in opposition to her work or to avenge the four students who lost their lives. So that's why Professor Schofield is asking for compensatory damages of at least $863,304. That's for damages to her personal and professional reputation, the equivalent of 10 years of her current compensation at the University of Idaho. And she's also asking the court to award her at least $1 million for pain and suffering related to her mental distress. Now this is where they talk about the Cardi B case against YouTuber Tasha K. If you didn't follow that case, whoa. She is aware of, I'm just going to call it Cardi B versus Tasha K, a recent case where a jury awarded the plaintiff $1 million as compensation for pain and suffering and $4,088,753 total after the defendant posted YouTube videos and Facebook posts that made false statements that the plaintiff had an STD, committed infidelity, was a hooker, took drugs. The defamatory statements were made using popular social media website and imputed crime crimes of moral turpitude. Indeed, if you didn't follow that case, I mean, Tasha Kay is a very popular YouTuber and a lot of people put their trust in her. Thought she had all these inside scoops. So there were really egregious things being said about Cardi B by this YouTuber, Tasha Kay. And she would say things like, 
Cardi B, oh, she had a, a mark on her lip, you know, signifying what she was signifying. And how could she kiss her baby with that? She's going to transmit it to the baby and, and did all these strange things with a bottle. I don't even want to say. Oh, yeah, she cheated on her husband. And back in the days when she was a stripper, she did all this stuff to men and blah, 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 blah. Very popular videos. It caused Cardi B so much distress. So finally, when it went to court, thank God, Cardi B won. And Tasha K, you know, if you watch her now, you'll see her say stuff like, I ain't got it. <laughs> I ain't got it. In the end, that won't cut it. You know, we have to be responsible for what we get on here and yap, yap, yap about. So in the end, Professor Schofield requests that the court enter a default judgment in favor of her that awards her at least $1.863 million. Whew, what's gonna happen with this? I don't know. In relation to that, let's take a look at what this YouTuber is saying about the Idaho Four survivors, their friend, before we look at Ashley Banfield's new report and how are people going to come up with this money for these judgments? Will the judge award Professor Schofield that much money? If I'm not mistaken, I think Ashley lives in an apartment. I don't know. Maybe she has at least one child, if I'm not mistaken. I feel bad for the children involved here. Of course, some of these judgments is more of setting an example of what not to do, just trying to make an example out of someone. But if a judge really decides to attach that much debt onto a person, I mean, a person can lose their property, a car, or they can have wages garnished. Who knows? TikTok pays crap, so I'm, I doubt that Ashley is making that much money over here, and by her doing that, she's literally taking food out of her own mouth, and if she has children, her child's mouth. But on to this other YouTube guy. He literally wrote in the description of his latest video, Dylan was the main target of three separate attempts on her life. Fight at Pi Fi was about Dylan and Ashlyn doing OnlyFans content together. All the Greeks found out. There was a fight. Some left. Some were kicked out. It's why Ashlyn moved out of 1122 King. Ashlyn ordered the hit, and the hit was to terminate Dylan. Dylan really did freeze on the night of November 13th. So did the attacker. They stood there staring at each other. The attacker couldn't terminate Dylan, so he ran. Then last week they came back to finish the job, but they failed. Someone called the cops. You know, you might as well put these skills to just writing a fictional novel, not about real people. All of this was about Dylan, he wrote. It has always been about Dylan being trans. So first of all, Dylan could win a lawsuit if she chose to against this guy by him claiming that she's a transgender female. And of course, if that's a lie, which I believe it is, then that's one thing. And all this machinations about some hit. And Ashlyn definitely has grounds for a lawsuit because he is literally telling people, and I haven't watched his entire videos, there's allegedly slanderous and libelous statements being made here, that this Ashlyn girl, you can see her in a video with Maddie. They were obviously friends, but he's claiming she ordered the hit. What a horrible thing to say. Imagine losing your friends and then you have some random guy in the Midwest who should know better accusing you of ordering the hit. These are real victims suffering real consequences. Look at Rebecca. I mean, it was affecting her sleep. We don't know if she, you know, Rebecca's getting hate mail. That means people have her address. Maybe it just went to the school, but still, if anything came to her home, maybe she had to spend money to relocate. I mean, I know I probably would. People take things too far, but these are real victims. These are not TV characters. So meanwhile, Ashley is over there rambling about whether Rebecca should have filed the lawsuit in federal court and not in Idaho because Ashley's in Texas. And she's giving flimsy excuses about, oh, I'd have to file electronically or mail it in hoping they get it. I don't think all these things are going to cut it if a judge decides to make an example out of her and award Rebecca a really high amount for her damages. Ashley might be trying to pay for this the rest of her life. And part of me does feel a little bit sorry for some of these creators who jump on TikTok or YouTube and they maybe they're like, oh, the true crime genre, I want to get in there. It's hot. I just want to surpass everyone and get all my subs and get all these views. So I'm just going to make up the most outrageous theories. I'm going to make up the most outrageous slander in order to get the views. Maybe they believe that's the way to build some wild digital journalistic career, but it's not. 
And maybe they do have mental health concerns. And that makes me sad, especially if there are children involved there. But that still doesn't negate the harm that's being caused. These TikTokers and YouTubers, you know, they kind of give a bad name to all of us because you see that type of behavior and people think, oh, you TikTokers and YouTubers are like that. All you do is just lie and blah, 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 blah. No, some of us do the quote unquote boring work, but I find it interesting of going to dig into these lawsuits look for new paperwork like I did today, dig through it and see what's actually going on with the case, not making up lies. I mean, it can take years and years and years to build a following, doing the work, getting on here, making the videos, researching, taking the time, sitting here, making the videos, editing the videos, uploading the videos, dealing with YouTube, all the things behind the scenes, grunt work, whatever you want to call it. It's better than getting on here, making up some fantastical stories that actually harm real people. The YouTubers should go back to the basics and learn the five W's of journalism. Who, what, when, where, and why. And learn the difference between speculation, slander, and libel. You know, it's one thing to speculate about, oh, look at the probable cause affidavit. It says that Dylan saw a subject and his bushy eyebrows and what do you think about that? And it says, that 911 wasn't contacted until 11.58, hours later. We can speculate about why that might be, and we can even speculate about why I believe Bethany, who was in the first floor, didn't come up to see the bodies or anything. Once she learned maybe something was happening, maybe she didn't hear anything all night, or maybe she did, maybe she was locked in her room. We don't have those details yet, and that's important. We wait for actual details, but we can speculate that, like I'm thinking, yeah, if I were Bethany, I wouldn't want to go upstairs either. She might not have known when she figured out something was going on. She might have thought, oh my goodness, is the perpetrator still in the house? And perhaps she walked straight out that front door on the first lower level into the parking lot where everyone else apparently had gathered that morning, Sunday, November 13th, 2022. That's speculation. It's quite another thing for a YouTuber to slander Bethany or Dylan or even Ashlyn and say, yeah, they ordered the hit. They were involved. We can't do that. Some of these people don't realize the harm they're doing. So the identity of the YouTuber has already been blasted over YouTube. So who knows if he'll end up being a defendant in another lawsuit. I wouldn't blame these young girls for filing them, getting lawyers if they do after the trial's over or whenever, because a lot of this speculation is a bridge too far. Now let's take a look at Ashley Banfield's News Nation report from February 20th, 2023. It was Monday's report. So there have been a lot of, you know, mysteries involving what, what happened in Idaho uh, to those four students who were murdered on King Road. So much yet to be uncovered about what happened and why Brian Kober is in custody. Lots of evidence that proves it, but so little about this young woman. Bethany Funk. She is the roommate um, who survived, but that we have not heard anything about. Nothing about Bethany Funk in the affidavits, nothing that she said that she witnessed. Dylan Mortensen right there in the middle, she's a, a key witness. She was able to give a description of height and physique and bushy eyebrows that led them to Brian Kohlberger, but, but Bethany, nothing. I'm so curious about what her role was in all of this, like what happened that morning when there was such chaos, where was she in all of that? And now we know some of the details involving Bethany Funk. A source close to the victim's families has told me that Bethany never ever emerged from the basement room. Like she never came upstairs. She left the home and was outside in the chaos in the front of the house, but never did go to that second floor, never did see the carnage. She wasn't part of the discovery of the bodies. She was the only one living in the basement at that point. Dylan, the other surviving roommate, you well know now, was on the second floor, had the room across from the kitchen, opened the door, peeked out and saw who she says looked like Brian Koberger with the bushy eyebrows, um, saw that male all clad in black with a black mask walking out. I wanna bring Lauren Mathias now. Uh, Lauren is the host of the Hidden True Crime podcast um, and YouTube channel. You know, she's never attended any of the memorials either, Lauren, and that is quite surprising given the fact that so many people did come to the memorials. The families came, the friends all came. 
roommates were there, but but Bethany really just sort of vanished. She did, even on social media. At that memorial that you mentioned, she had a letter read. She shared that Maddie was the big sister that she never had, and she was her actual big sister at their sorority. She stated that Maddie had told her that everything happens for a reason, but that she just couldn't understand how this could have happened. And she did. She sort of vanished after that, not even really showing up in the probable cause affidavit. The source close to the victim's families who spoke with me also said that she has not communicated at all with any of the the survivor's families, um, that she's really just gone gone dark. And I'm wondering if you know if she's gone back to Nevada. There's, there's some talk that she's gone back to be with family um, in Nevada during all of this time. I've heard a similar thing. I haven't been able to confirm that she's back here in Nevada, but no one that I've talked to has seen her on campus at this time. You know, we've heard from Ethan's mother that Ethan's siblings have gone back to campus. They're trying to move forward, Uh, but we haven't heard that Bethany is back there. And we do know that she's from the Nevada area. And that's what I've been told too. Although again, I've had a hard time confirming that as well, but nobody I've um... talked to has seen her. It's so surprising to hear this, uh, that she never emerged from, from the basement. She didn't come up to the, to the scene in the second floor. Um, but do we know about her interviews with the police? Because there's no way that police did not interview her before she where, went to wherever she is now. Right. We know that early on in the investigation, police did state that the surviving roommates had been cooperating and they did say that they had been interviewing them. And then again, as you mentioned, we Dylan showed up in the probable cause affidavit as a, as a as a witness, right? But we have heard very little about Bethany, except for the fact that she did seem to get a tattoo with Dylan about a week and a half after Dylan posted that picture, though, not Bethany. And, you know, so so all we know from police is that they were they were um, cooperative. But I've heard the same thing that, uh, you know, I know that Kaylee's family, when they've been interviewed, have also stated that they had not talked to the surviving Roommates. Sad. It's, it's, it's got to be such incredible trauma and everyone processes differently. Lauren Mathias, thank you. Appreciate it. And Ashley Banfield got a tip. She claims her source is someone close to the families, the victims' families, I believe. She said that Bethany on the first floor left the home and was outside in the chaos in front of the house, but never did go to that second floor, never did see the carnage. She wasn't part of the discovery of the bodies. She was the only one living in the basement at that point. And I think, you know, it's for the best. All the people who didn't see the aftermath of that horrible crime, the better. We learned about Ethan's best friend making the call, making the discovery. Maybe he was one of the only few, of course, with authorities who discovered the bodies as well. Perhaps there were a limited amount of people who saw them, and of course the coroner and others who would have to see them. But I'm grateful for them keeping certain EMTs back as we learned on that 2020 or Dateline report from the girl named Martha who was there and was waiting for Ethan to show up for a study group. As Martha said, even EMTs were kept back. So I'm grateful some people were kept away from the scene. The fewer folks who trampled through that scene, the better in terms of evidence. Also, in terms of their mental health, the fewer people that saw those victims in that way, the better. The less of a PTSD mental imagery they would have to try and get out of their minds. And some people who've seen stuff like that say they never get it out of their minds. Dylan, the other surviving roommate, was on the second floor, the room across the kitchen, So it's no wonder she was able to hear more and open the door and there's confusion about what she was hearing. Was it like partying? Was, you know, yelling allegedly for them to shut the F up up there? But then when the perpetrator walked past her, is that when she was like, whoa, was that really a party or what was it? Again, we won't know until if and when Dylan testifies in court. And now I see why Bethany isn't mentioned as much in the probable cause affidavit because if she was on that first level, and she just walked out. Of course, she likely wasn't a witness to much in terms of hearing things or even seeing things. Another thing Ashley Banfield said is that a close family friend spoke with her and said that Bethany has not communicated at all with any of the survivors' families, which is probably perhaps the smartest thing to do. 
just gone dark. She might be back in Nevada. We don't know. You know, even though Ethan's siblings returned to campus, I know it's likely different for Bethany. Just being literally in that house and surviving such a slaughter. Bethany and Dylan, you don't know when, if ever, they'll come back to campus. Of course, they'd be besieged with questions. And even if Bethany had simply reached out to Kaylee's dad or Maddie's dad or even Ethan's family, and just said, I'm so sorry for what happened. I'm sorry I didn't hear anything. I'm sorry I didn't call 911 sooner or whatever. Even if that's like a knee-jerk reaction and a knee-jerk feeling, I don't know, I'm just pontificating and speculating. That's something a lawyer would advise a client not to do because you wouldn't want any type of culpability to be put in writing or misconstrued or anything like that. It's probably best to wait till everything's over. Brian goes to trial if he's convicted and put away or whatever penalty he gets, maybe then the girls will be able to talk. But that's kind of all we know. Like Lauren Mathias with Hidden True Crime told Ashley, we saw the photos of Dylan and perhaps it was Bethany getting the tattoos, you know, of the initials of the victims after the crime. And maybe that's all we will hear from them until when and if there's a trial. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 22. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Indeed, the last Adam they call him. Thank you so much for watching all of this and stay tuned.